not a dividend. It's a tale of two quan. Now, your losses are on someone else's balance sheet. Generally speaking, airdrops are kind of pointless anyways. Um, um, unnamed trading firms who are very involved. Um, I like that ETH is the ultimate ponzi. DeFi protocols are the antidote to this problem. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Chopping Block. Every couple of weeks, the four of us get together and give the industry insider's perspective on the crypto topics of the day. So quick intros. First, we've got Tom, the DeFi maven and master of memes. Next, we've got Robert, the crypto connoisseur and the czar of Superstate. Then we've got Tarun, the giga brain and grand poobah at Gauntlet. And today we've got a special guest, Jesse Pollock, the layer two linchpin and leader of base. And finally, I'm Haseeb, the head hype man at Dragonfly. So we're early stage investors in crypto, but I want to caveat that nothing we say here is investment advice, legal advice, or even life advice. Please see choppingblock.xyz for more disclosures. Jesse, it's great to have you on the show. We've been trying for a while to get you on, and we've been talking a lot of shit about base, and so we thought it was probably time <laughs> to get you on here to be able to defend your, your creation. Um, how has it been seeing base popping off like this? It's, it's actually crazy. Over the weekend, it's been going nuts. Yeah, well, first off, thanks for having me, guys. I've been looking forward to this, I think, since we tried to do it at the testnet announcement. Uh, we couldn't make it happen then, and now we're back here for mainnet. So um, excited to be here. Uh, huge fan, longtime listener. Uh, how does it feel that base is popping off? I mean, it's cool. It's awesome. It's exciting to see so much of the ecosystem excited about what we're doing. I think um, it also feels like it's still day one. You know, like we have so much more to go, uh, so much further to build. Uh, I think when we think about what success looks like, it's bringing billions of people on chain. And I think the reality is that today there's hundreds of thousands of people on chain, kind of best case scenario. And so there's just a lot more work to do. And I, I don't want to get distracted by the short term stuff, mostly just focused on the long term we're building towards. What do you think of internally as the North Star? Like, what is the, what is the one true metric that you guys are optimizing for? Is it transactions? Is it users? Is it... TVL is something else, the developers. What do you think about? The two, the two ones that we repeat every day are a million builders, a billion users. Um, so it's a, a million people who are going to create the next experiences that uh, the a billion people actually come on chain to use. And I think we're starting to see uh, kind of that next wave of experiences really being built this summer. Uh, stuff like friend tech, stuff like base paint, um, you know, obviously the DeFi stuff is happening too and, and NFTs, but um, I think it feels to me like we're a little bit of an inflection point right now where we're starting to see real consumer use cases that actually have the potential to bring in millions of people, tens of millions of people. Um, and that, that's probably what gets me the most fired up. Actually, I have one question related to that is, which is you have this like thousand to one ratio between users and developers. In other ecosystems, is, is that does that exist? Is there like a reason you chose a thousand to one, or is it just that it's like easy to add three zeros? I think it's it's mostly that it's it it is it's medic and it's easy. I think when we look at the like uh, scale, there's also some alignment, right? There's something like thirty thousand developers in crypto today, uh, and it feels achievable for us to get like a hundred x. Um, or something like 100x on the developer side. Similarly, on the user side, you know, there's like you know maybe a million people on chain, but somewhere between 10 and 100 million people uh, who've used crypto before. And uh, again, there it seems possible to get 10 to 100x. Uh, and so I think mostly what we're saying is like let's set some ambitious goals that are um, achievable, but also kind of like pretty far out. Uh, and those felt like the right ones. And then they had the nice kind of balance of also being easy to say, easy to repeat, easy to drill home as kind of the North starts for our team, which I think is really important when you're setting goals. Got it. So one of the big mimetic things happening on base has been friends.tech. Actually, just yesterday, Tarun and I were going back and forth trying to trying to one off each other in terms of our, our key price. Sorry, they're not called shares anymore. Now they're called, they're called keys. It was mainly you who cared about winning this. I'm just, I, you know, whatever. Let me just say for the friends. <laughs> to, to be clear, now that I've lost, I no longer care. I've, I'm totally over it. It was, a, it was all a joke. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it, it, it's been taking off like crazy. So I think we talked about it a couple shows ago, and it seemed to be getting some attention, and it started dying off. And then last weekend, it sort of went even higher, uh, where you had a lot of actually normies started to get on the platform of like NBA players and some you know less crypto native venture capitalists who started getting into the game. What have you guys been seeing and how do you think about, you, you basically now have this kind of super tenant in the same way, you know, we often talked about this back in the day on Solana of Solana being like this sort of super tenant blockchain where there's one app that's taking almost all of the energy and 
transaction volume and, and uh, TVL, that seems to be friend.tech right now for base. How do you guys think about that? And how do you think about supporting an app that is driving most of the attention uh, for base today? Yeah, well, first off, I think it's been really exciting to see um, and and Racer and Shrimp and the whole team are awesome. You know, they've been, they've been building social experiences on chain for a long time. You know, like Steelcam before Friend Tech, uh, I think was really innovative, and they learned a lot from that. Now it's cool to see them kind of like run it back and uh, start to have some success with Friend Tech. So we're we're really excited about that, and I think our general thesis is we want to help builders be successful on base. And this is a product that's starting to be really successful. And so we're leaning in to figure out how we can support them. Uh, there's a bunch of ways we're doing that. Um, you know, you probably see me talking about front tech pretty frequently. Uh, so trying to kind of just like support from a messaging and narrative perspective, from a technology perspective, we're obviously leading in to make sure that they have all the tools and resources that they need in order to be successful. Um, and then from a kind of ecosystem perspective, uh, in as much as they have dependencies or, you know, other things that they need to get solved, we're kind of behind the scenes trying to make that happen. Happen. And so it's kind of all hands on deck. And I think in general, my feeling on this is we're at this point where we're going to start seeing this happen, like not one off, but frequently, you're going to start having real products that get built. And those products aren't going to kind of follow the growth cycle that we're used to in crypto for the last decade, which is like kind of flat. <laughs> but like the technology is actually ready now where we're going to start having consumer products that are launched and then they grow. And they grow week over week, month over month, quarter over quarter, and they reach millions of people and tens of millions of people and billions of people. And I think that that is, that's going to be so exciting. And it, for us, it's like, that's what it's all about. It's finding and supporting the people who are creating those products, giving them everything they need in order to build them and grow them. And uh, then trying to just hang on and make sure that we can actually keep scaling the infrastructure so that it's ready for the um, level of transactions who put they're trying to put through it um, and, and ready for the number of people who are actually going to come on chain. What do you think the biggest differentiators are in terms of that ability to you know, attract developers and applications and a lot of usage. What was what are the differences between base and other L2 platforms? You know, how do you think this really offers something different than, you know, Optimism or even Arbitrum or, you know, something that's not exactly the same, but similar like Matic? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually curious about this also in the context of front tech, given that Steelcam was on Arbitrum. And so I'm curious in your conversation with Racer, what kind of you know, driving the decision to, to build on base this time around? Yeah. So first off, I think our general thesis on this is that like it's going to take all of us, right? It's not going to be just base that scales Ethereum. It's going to be a massive kind of team effort from all of these layer twos that are working together to make Ethereum scale. And it's kind of like the bottoms up version of the original scaling strategy for Ethereum, um, where we actually have a bunch of these layer twos that come together to provide kind of throughput for Ethereum overall. And so like first and foremost, the pie is still very small, we need to grow the pie uh, and get it massive. And that's going to be something that we all do kind of in collaboration. I think the, the second thought and the thing that I, I think we have the opportunity to do really well, kind of differentiate on is getting that kind of end to end user experience uh, really seamless, both for uh, builders and uh, users. Uh, and this comes really from the, the kind of close collaboration that we have with Coinbase. Um, Base is obviously being incubated inside of Coinbase. And what that means is that um, I think we have a really clear visibility into like basically the whole cycle of a user from the kind of consumer interface in Coinbase and Coinbase wallet all the way through to the underlying chain infrastructure that exists with Base. And I think what, what that's going to allow us to do is it's basically going to allow us to look at every step in the user journey, you know, from getting your wallet, getting a you know seed phrase and figuring out how to back that up all the way through to funding your wallet, all the way through to using the first app and then kind of being retained in the, in the app over time and figure out how do we optimize that super, super relentlessly. And I think that's kind of a unique thing that Base and Coinbase have together in collaboration. Like I get to go and sit and work with those teams every day to make sure that they, they are, you know, that to make sure that we're working in, in the right direction. Now, I... I wish I could say that that was all perfect. And like, that's that, that's the solution. It's like, oh, now everything works. And if you build on base, like it's going to be 100% seamless for every user that's coming in. We're Like the reality is we're not there yet. Um, and we have a lot more work to do. But I think that feedback loop is the thing that gets me really, really excited. And then 
In terms of just, you know, friend tech specifically, Tom, going back to your question, you know, I've had a bunch of conversations with Racer over the last few months. Um, our team had a bunch of conversations with Racer over the, few, uh, over the whole team over, over the last few months. And they were excited about base. We were excited about them. Um, we found ways to support them and lean in. And um, we're grateful that they're building with us. And so there's not like one thing here. I'd say it's more just like, you know, a bunch of opportunities coming together and uh, us getting to work together to build the future. So super excited about building with them. Let, let me ask one, you know, follow up question then. So you've mentioned a few times that you were able to really support them, you know, from the perspective of creating a chain, you know, what specific things did you do to support them? Yeah, I think it's still really early in the journey, right? Like, uh, you know, they, they started building this, you know, however many months ago, um, we kind of tapped in with them. Uh, and started kind of like listening and hearing what their needs were, their needs around distribution and social. And uh, we kind of figured out how to make that happen. Um, although I think there's more we can do there. Um, and then right now we're thinking a lot about technology, uh, basically like how do we make it easier for people to get funds into friend tech? How do we make it easier for uh, them to kind of scale on top of base? How do we make it easier for people to do their first transaction? Um, and so those are a bunch of conversations that we're having right now. Uh, basically try to figure out like what can we do to make these product experiences more seamless. So if I can read between the lines a little bit, Jesse, you know, naively, I would think that, okay, you guys are, you guys are launching an OP stack rollup. It's more or less, as far as I understand, it's more or less OP stack off the shelf. Like mm -hmm. there, there's not maybe a lot of modifications you guys are making directly to how the it's blockchain the runs. Yeah. Um, so I would assume that when you say, look, we're doing stuff to support them, it's like co-marketing, making the bridging experience easy maybe having an integration with Coinbase wallet. Is that the kind of thing that you guys are, are gesturing at when you say supporting them? Or are there other things that I'm not imagining there? No, yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Yeah, it's basically figuring out how do we make the experience more seamless? How do we help them get distribution? Um, how do we make sure that their users are getting an you know, easy first transactions uh, into the app? Got it, got it, okay. So one of the things that's interesting that many people have commented on uh, between base and the other L2s is that most of the other L2s have a token and that token is often used to attract developers, uh, subsidize early applications. You know, there's, there's a playbook, right? And we all kind of know the playbook. We all, we're all in crypto. Uh, Base presumably does not have access to that playbook because you guys don't have a token and you're, and my understanding is that you guys don't plan to. How do you think about that when you're thinking about, hey, I want to attract the marginal entrepreneur. I can't wave a token around and say, hey, blah, 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 you know, come, come get it. So what do you, what do you think of as the, the, the different kind of value proposition you have versus an optimism or an arbitrum or a ZK sync that, that can make the same kind of claim? Yeah. I mean, I think when we look at the space over the last kind of five years, I think that what we see basically is that there's been a lot of economic incentives for people to make certain technology decisions, which at times have obscured uh, like product incentives of like this product works really well, uh, or it's easy to use, or it's uh, something that we don't want to build in from a community perspective. And so I think our thesis is like, there's actually an opportunity if we kind of decouple those things and focus on just building a really great product, whether that product is the blockchain itself or the blockchain plus distribution through Coinbase and, and kind of the Coinbase brand and channels and et cetera, or that plus the community that is being built around base and just kind of let that stand on its own. And so that's basically what we're focused on. It's like, what can we do to basically make it so this is something that people want to use uh, intrinsically rather than something that people want to use extrinsically? I think there's still opportunities for us to use financial levers, right? For instance, right now, we, we're running a prop house round, um, which is kind of nouns infrastructure uh, for rewarding people retroactively for contributions that they made. Uh, we're running that for on-chain summer and building on base. And um, we, we, we've seen more submissions to that uh, than any prop house round in history because there's just so much energy and excitement. And I think that that's a great example of like, you, you don't have to have a token to start experimenting with and using structures to reward people for contributing to an ecosystem. And I think we're excited about doing that in a more rigorous way because we don't just have kind of this endless uh, economic thing that, you know, is a little bit of magic. Uh, but instead, we have kind of like the rigor of trying to figure out how do we A, make this product work really, really well. But then B, how do we create structures that align incentives and bring people in and reward them for their contributions and help them grow and be successful? I, I love that. And I think it shows a lot of clarity of understanding what the value proposition is of having a layer two backed by, you know, a super massive 
consumer facing exchange like Coinbase, um, you guys have a different set of advantages and it sounds like you're leveraging them really well. It's been notable, you know, looking at the stats. Uh, so I just want to run through a couple stats real quick about how quickly base has been growing. The daily active addresses on base is now over a hundred thousand uh, transactions per day, nearing 1 million, which actually puts you on a per day basis or like, you know, hourly basis, you guys are doing more TPS than any other L2. Actually, you guys are now doing more TPS than, than Ethereum itself. Now, interestingly, a lot of this TPS seems to be bots. And specifically, it looks like there's a lot of MEV bots that are now playing around on base. And so what I, I was reading a thread this morning by Bert from Flashbots, and basically he describes um, this phenomenon that when somebody bridges in, so it's, it's a little bit complicated if you don't understand how friends.tech works, but basically the idea of friendtech is that uh, when somebody signs up on friendtech, they, I guess, claim their account and then you can start trading their shares, but you can actually buy their shares before they even exist on friendtech. So you can sort of buy them in advance of them claiming them and starting to market themselves. Is that still uh, true? And so what these, I, I assume so. You can't buy, you can't buy their shares before they, or their keys um, before they oh, buy them. Oh, they have them. to bridge in first. You, they you have to in initialize have to, their account. They have to initialize their they account. They initialize and their account. That, I see, I see, buy, I see. Uh, keys afterwards. They get the first share for Got free. It. And yeah, then yeah. it's the wild got it, got it, got it. Bots. Okay, so my so uh, yeah, maybe I'm misunderstanding the thread, but I, I think Bert's Bert was back running those transactions. So if I see see that you're about to sign up for Frentech, I can just you know you get the first free uh, key, and then I get to buy all the ones that are you know immediately after you for like zero got it, got it, got point it. zero 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 one. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the initial part of the bonding curve is just eaten up immediately by these uh, uh, MEV. Front runners, essentially. That's how you got to uh, get over Tarun's key price, right? You add your own. Uh, well, that, no. Bot so interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, just this morning, I guess the back running bots that must have ran up my bonding because I did when I signed up, I was like, "Huh, my price is like actually weirdly high. Like this seems like kind of difficult for people to buy because it's like two hundred bucks when I or like it was like a hundred bucks when I first signed up, and I was like, really? Like you, you start with a hundred bucks? Like that's really weird. But I was like, oh, maybe it's like tied to my Twitter followers or something. I didn't even think about it. And then, you know, over the day I was like, oh, hey guys, you know, buy my shares, whatever. Now they're called keys, buy my keys. They're obviously, for <laughs> totally, totally innocuous reasons, they changed the word from shares to keys. Um, and then this morning, my, the, the price of my shares just lopped in half. And I was like, wait, what the fuck happened? Because I didn't see any sales on the platform. And uh, somebody on Twitter said, probably it's that the platform is not indexing uh, sales that are happening off platform, which meant that probably what happened was that the front runners who drove up my share price initially, like market sold everything this morning, back down the uh, the bonding curve uh, and basically just dumped on everybody who owned my keys. So that seems to be what happened, which is, yeah, which is a super bummer. But like, also, I, I it didn't show any of this on the actual UI. So anyway, I thought it was very interesting. Jesse, I don't know if you have any thoughts on seeing this kind of organic, crazy crypto sniping behavior starting to dominate on base. I mean, it's a sign that things are working, but it's also a kind of weird side effect of things working. Yeah. What do you think about I mean, it? It's crypto, right? Like this is <laughs> this is what we've been seeing in crypto for uh I think the whole history of crypto. That when there's activity and excitement and energy, you get a bunch of new emergent behaviors that you maybe couldn't predict. Um, a lot of it ends up being uh, put into fast running software systems uh, that simulate what, what humans might do uh, if they had the opportunity to do it at the speed that the software systems can do it. Um, and then you get like more efficient markets, uh, you get a bunch of learnings out of it, and you get kind of a natural equilibrium uh, where people end up, uh, you know, uh, figuring it out. And so, you know, I, I kind of see this as the the journey that we're on, you know, base has been around for two weeks. Friend tech has been around for two weeks. <laughs> we have a lot more work to do to figure out like how do all these systems fit together in a way that, uh, you know, uh, can reach billions of people. And so that's mostly what we're focused on. It's like, how do we make this work really well for the next million people? Um, and how do we make sure that that's done in a way that's super thoughtful? So as I was playing around with friend tech, one of the things that I thought would be really great to do on the show. So, you know, we're, we're, we're investors, the four, the four of us, and we spent a lot of time looking at different social apps and different pitches for social applications in crypto. And obviously most of those applications have not really worked. And so what I'd love to do is just kind of do a little bit of a teardown and a bit of a retro of like, why, why has friend tech been so effective? Like, what are the things that it got right that many other applications that try to do the same kind of thing. Like this is actually the idea of speculating on your friends or on social media identities uh, is actually an old idea. It's actually been tried many times before in crypto. And in previous iterations, it didn't really work. 
So I'm curious from the lot of you, Jesse and also, you know, Tom, Tarun, Robert, what have you seen in Frentech that they got right that other previous attempts to do this have failed? I, I mean, I think there's a lot. I think there's uh, technical decisions and sort of product decisions that have been pretty, pretty spot on. Uh, technically, I think uh, some of the choices they made, I think I, it's very easy to comp it to BitCloud, which is probably the most, you know, in recent memory, closest sort of uh, uh, similar product to, to what Frontex doing. Very, very different sort of technical approach, right? Like rolling its own VCH fork that you had to like bridge into. It was like, it was like this weird little sort of separate thing versus building on an L2 with ETH that's like, you know, much more uh, approachable and, and has sort of a much more adjacent market. But I think more specifically, I, I think the choice of doing a progressive web app plus using sort of a wall as a service product uh, like Privy, it, it, like, it, it feels like a, as, as pretty, as good as you can get without building a truly native application, which is obviously difficult with sort of the app store policies. So um, Tom, you can, can you explain, this, can you, can, sorry, can you explain a little bit what you mean by using a wallet as a service app and how that, ob, how that obviates the app store stuff? Yeah, so people can log in to uh, Privy, which is this uh, wall as a service company. They use uh, MPC to sort of store your private key across multiple different computers. But you can log in using your phone number, which is kind of the standard you know, auth that people use today. Um, you can use uh, Google, you can use Apple. Um, and so it, 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 that sort of auth experience is what people are used to from a you know, modern social application. Um, and you know, a lot of people have been trying to build these kinds of services or these kinds of uh, products uh, and push them to the App Store. Apple has been pretty uh, antagonistic with respect to their policies on crypto, trying to either ban it entirely or push it through its you know 30% uh, uh, fee on, on digital purchases. Because Frontech is not a native application, it's a progressive web application. So it, it runs in your browser, um, uh, but it looks and feels a little bit like a native application. It doesn't have to go through the app store. You can just you know put it on your phone directly because it's at, like accessing the website um, and you don't need to sort of um, um, go through the app store policy. So, it's been pretty massive, I think, in terms of distribution and onboarding. Um, in addition to sort of these choices around, you know, using uh, a, a proper L2 like like base, and not for any sort of ideological reason, but simply for the ease of access to um, sort of the developer tooling, the user ergonomics that people are used to. Um, I think those have been pretty massive. Um, and then from a product decision, uh, again, one of the, the issues with BitCloud was like sort of the, the exact thing you were talking about with with back running, where people could speculate on shares before people were live on the platform, and so. Obviously, that, that pissed people off, but it also kind of created this sort of experience where it was not a very like dense party, right? You didn't know who was actively on the platform, um, whose shares you were actually going to engage with, and they would actually respond. You you know that when you're buying a share, there's someone has actively chosen to be on the platform, and it's it's like a, a live player. And so I, I think those are some of like the small decisions that actually add up to a cumulative uh, different experience than um, um, some of the other comps that we've seen in the in the ecosystem. I was going to say, so I signed up for Frentech last night. So I've been a user for like all of 12 hours or something like that. And the thing that I think they've done really well is that whether it's, you know, sniper bots, you know, accumulating the keys, or like humans accumulating the keys, there's this very quick positive reward loop, you know, economically and mentally. When you log on, you've been a user for like a minute. And for some reason, there's like more ether in your address than what you like deposited. So like you deposit like $20 of ether and then you look at your phone, and you're like, wait, I have like $150 worth of ether. Like what happened? And I think like the thing that they nailed is that like, as soon as you sign up, you have free money in a very like, you know, this or a way. And I haven't really experienced that um, in too many other applications. And I think to, like, it's such a powerful mechanism that I think is underexplored. And it's, you know, it's a function of that bonding curve combined with the fact that the, you know, individual is the one receiving the portion of the trading fees off of every purchase and sale. But just like one minute into your application experience, seeing extra money, that's, that, that's a hook. Yeah, I, strong plus one on that. I think that that is an incredible mechanic that they've built there. I'll, I'll share two thoughts. So first off, like, I think just from a virality perspective, Racer is the best in the game in crypto right now at creating that. And so like separate and distinct from the product, I feel like just watching him work is honestly like inspiring. <laughs> so something special uh, in terms of kind of bringing the right people in, playing you know, the timing in the right way. And so huge credit to him and the team for, I think, like landing that. Um, I think what Robert said on the the product side is is totally right. They've 
they've really nailed the experience for just like the individual who's creating the room because you feel like you want to keep engaging because it's just, it's a feedback loop that's positive. Where if you do the right engagement, you're going to earn a little bit more money. You're going to get access to more people. People are going to start engaging with you. Um, and I think that that's, that's really been awesome to see. But then going back to what Tom said, I think that the component of this where they, I think, are really the first people to bring together all of these technology pieces that have been coming, but not quite there. Uh, and that when they fit together, actually make a better experience than kind of we've ever seen in crypto. Uh, and that's pretty uniquely possible because of what Ethereum does, right? Like the MPC wallet, Privy, right? Like we've been talking to them for a long time. I've known Henry, the founder, for a long time. And they added, you know, they built on base and they also support other EVM chains. And that just works. Like they can just decide to use that. Uh, you know, they were having scaling issues and, uh, you know, we reached out and we're talking with them and we got them on a new node provider to have more scalability for their front end. Like that just works because of Ethereum, right? Like they, uh, when they first launched, they, they didn't have a bridging mechanism in the app. And then they uh, pretty quickly just added the ability to bridge natively in the app from L1 to L2. And that just works because of the way the OP stack is built. And so I think there's like a bunch of these pieces that just work, but that just work is the result of basically like seven years of infrastructure investments that have happened um, from teams on Ethereum L1, from teams on L2, from teams on building this kind of infrastructure around it all. And that is what enables it to fit together and enables the pe person to get to the experience that Robert's talking about from a product perspective in like 30 seconds rather than what you were talking about, Hasib, with Bitka, where it was like 10 minutes, you know? <laughs> and then when you're in that Bitka world, like you don't have access to that kind of like rapid iteration where it's like, oh, this node provider doesn't work, like swap in a new one. Like, oh, like this bridge experience isn't great. Like let's upgrade the bridge experience. Let's add a pay, uh, you know, instant on-ramp from a credit card. Like that speed of iteration that I think is enabled by EVM and the technology ecosystem that's been built about around EVM, I think is going to enable this next generation of apps. And I think uh, Frentech has really been, it's, it's like the first one, like they, they're first through the line uh, in trying that out, making the pieces fit together and building a really compelling product experience around it. So huge kudos to them for, I think, showing all of us like, whoa, this is now finally possible. The other thing that I, I found striking about Frentech versus the previous attempts to build these kind of social trading type experiences is that uh, this innovation of like having the chat rooms. So for those of you who are not aware, when you buy somebody's keys, you get access to a sort of private chat room where the people who are chatting can't see each other's messages, but the person whose keys they're buying, they can see, everyone can see their messages to everybody. Uh, so sort of a one-way kind of, you know, channel, like almost like a Telegram channel that you can just blast out updates. The feature itself is a little bit half baked, right? It's a bit simplistic. It's like doesn't it's it doesn't quite have a great affordance, I think, but it's something that is not just you know money number go up, number go down. And I think most of these other applications, like they're just not as shareable, and they don't have the same like reason to keep opening back up the app if you don't just want to obsessively check the prices. Um, and this, I think, is another element that they figured out that even though the chat interface itself is like a little janky and it like is, is, is not quite fully, I think, where it should be in terms of uh, tapping into a real social instinct. Um, it, it, it still, I think, actually puts it significantly, makes it significantly more um, addictive than a pure financial app, especially because for a lot of people, you know, for Robert, if you have a big following, you sign up and people are buying your keys and you're getting this instant positive feedback. Most people, when they sign up, they're not getting that instant positive feedback, right? But you, you buy you buy someone's keys, you start chatting with them, they're chatting back at you, and all of a sudden there is something that is engaging you in this app and pulling you closer into the ecosystem, something you can share online that's not just, hey, I made money today, but, oh, I had this like fun chat with this like this super celebrity who I, who I bought their keys. That, I think, has been a real, that I feel like is a real product insight as well that they managed to latch onto, even if it's still relatively underbaked as a as yeah. a feature of the product. And I think the thing, the thing that gets me excited about it is it's not hard to see how that mechanic and just the experience expands into more complex involved things. And so like one thing that I did in my room was like, I was like, Hey, like answer this question and I'll airdrop this NFT. Like I'll send this NFT to one of you. 
right? And the way I did it is people just replied and they send their ENS address and then I picked one of them and I send it. But like that adding that feature to this app because you already have everyone's addresses, because you already have this chat room with everyone where you can see everyone, it's like that's not a hugely complex feature to add, which is like show all your NFTs, pick one and airdrop it to someone in the room and do it randomly in a provable way. Like that I think is is what we're going to see next from the team is like they're going to start adding more functionality and they're going to start saying, oh, we started with this really simple experience, but now here's all these other things that you can start to do. And I think the people are going to be surprised or my intuition, I don't have any like visibility really into the full roadmap, but I think my intuition is that people will be surprised at how quickly they're able to iterate on that experience because of the platform that they're building on, because it's just an incredibly powerful platform building on EVM. So Jesse, you were mentioning a lot about the advantage of building on the OP stack, the great infrastructure. One of the criticisms that has been levied at base, and we've, I think we've reiterated some of that criticism on the show, is the fact that right now OP stack has no fraud proofs, which effectively means that OP stack, you know, if, if you guys so chose, you guys being Coinbase or whatever, the, the operator of the, of the L2, uh, if they so chose, you could essentially modify the chain without having anybody able to intercede and actually, you know, say, hey, you, you actually broke some validity rules of the chain. Here's the proof. How do you guys think about that internally at Coinbase? There's been this kind of broad criticism. I think it's kind of died down now that there's something to do on the blockchain. But, you know, last week, I think people were, people were mostly, you know, writing think pieces. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, like when there's less to do, people are just like, they find uh, ways to take pot shots, uh, including on the show. What, I just wanted to give you... Um, an opportunity to respond, and especially because we've also levied some of that criticism. What's your take on this question of, hey, is it an L2 if you if the fraud proofs don't exist yet? And, and where is that on your guys' roadmap? Yeah, well, first off, like getting fault proofs live, um, and we call them fault proofs because fraud has a very specific meaning in a bunch of other places. And so fault is a much clearer term for the, the technical thing that's going on here. Um, but getting fault proofs live is like the P0 priority across all of the OP stack contributors. And so uh, OP Labs is working on it. We're working on it. Uh, and I think if you look at the path that we're taking, it's a different path. Than, other, than, than what other folks have taken. But we feel really excited and confident in it. And we think what it's going to get us to is it's going to get us to a you know stage two roll up with multiple fault proof implementations uh, faster, uh, even if it take is uh, taking us a little bit of time to get there for the first one. Um, so that's, sorry, that's can, the first can you define thing. what a layer two, or sorry, what a stage two roll up is? Yeah, stage two roll up is basically like if using Vitalik's terminology of stage zero, stage one, stage two. It's the like furthest along in terms of decentralization. And so there's kind of more decentralization. And we think one of the really important characteristics is that you actually have multiple fault proofs running in parallel, which allows you to turn down the level of controllability from an upgrade multi-sig. And so what we're doing right now is we actually have two fault proof implementations being worked on in parallel, one using opgeth, which is kind of like the existing execution client for the OP stack, and then another one using opref, which is another client that is being built around ref, which Paradigm is building. And in general, the way we built the OP stack is such that we're not just going to have opgeth and opref, we're also going to have op nethermind and op aragon and op pretty much every Ethereum client, which is going to give us more redundancy. And that's that's the kind of whole vision of the OP stack. It's like, let's build an open source composable modular framework that really inherits from Ethereum so that we can have as much resiliency from having multiple implementations as possible. It's a little bit slower. We literally spent two years rewriting the whole platform onto this stack with Bedrock. But now we think we're going to be able to move a lot faster to get to that ultimate end state. So that's the P0 priority. Um, in terms of how we think about this at Coinbase, you know, we talked a lot about like what was basically what is the minimum level of decentralization or sufficient decentralization that we felt comfortable launching the network with. And where we netted out was um, we didn't feel comfortable launching the network if there was going to be one single party that could uh, make kind of these decisions around fault proofs or make these decisions around uh, network upgrades. And so that's the way we've configured the network as well. Uh, and we're actually going to be talking about this on Thursday. Uh, we haven't shared it publicly, but uh, it's all kind of on chain. And basically what we've done is we've said, hey, like we need to configure the upgrade keys in such a way that Coinbase is not a single point of failure and doesn't have a single uh, kind of source of control. And we need to configure what's called the challenger keys, which is basically in the absence of the fully on-chain fault proofs, who could challenge a proof uh, and kind of revert it. 
Uh, and so similarly there, Coinbase uh, is not the only challenger. So there's actually an, another challenger that could do that uh, from the optimism side. And so both of those structures basically mean that if Coinbase were to submit an, invalid, uh, an invalid proof, someone could challenge it and say, hey, like you actually can't do that. Uh, and then if Coinbase were to try and do an upgrade, like we couldn't do an upgrade. We are not sufficient to upgrade the chain or upgrade the uh, smart contracts on the L1 in order to make some uh, negative change. And we've combined both of those things with a commitment to this thing called the law of chains, uh, which is a like, very formative doc uh, that we spent basically nine months collaborating on with um, some folks at Optimism. We just opened up for community review, which basically defines what we think about as the neutrality framework for base, for OP mainnet, and for other OP stack chains um, that says, hey, like, the block space of these chains has to be equivalent, it has to be open, it has to be permissionless, and we have to protect the users who are running on these chains as the most important priority above anything else, above Coinbase's right to run the chain, to govern the chain, to sequence the chain, protecting users and that access to open, permissionless, homogenous block space is the single most important thing. And so the combination of that decentralization of the upgrade keys, the decentralization of the challenger keys, and the commitment to this law of chains basically put us into a place where we felt comfortable, hey, this is sufficiently decentralized, where Coinbase couldn't unilaterally make a decision that would violate the law of chains. It would actually require us at least convincing some other large set of people to do that. Uh, and so that that's kind of what we, what we felt was the starting point. And then from there, there's obviously a lot more work. And we think we're going to progress to that work really quickly. So if Jesse woke up one morning and turned, you know, into like a super dark, you know, exploiter, <laughs> dark you, know, you just go full black hat, you know, <clears throat> what's the most that you could do just running the sequencer, you know, to take money from users? Yeah. So the, the, what, what the sequencer can do is basically can you say, Hey, we're not going to accept certain transactions. Um, like you can't take money from users. There's no ability for the sequencer to take money from users. Can you um, so reorder say, the hey, sequence? You can't reorder the sequence once it lands on L1. And so as long as the sequencer is submitting transactions to L1, reordering the sequence would require using the challenger key or using the upgrade keys. But prior to it landing on L1, if you, if you were to turn into a full MEV, you know, uh, yeah, that I think like basically anyone, you know, in any L2 construction prior to the transactions landing on L1, there's the opportunity for the sequencer to make decisions about ordering. And that's also a part of the neutrality framework. And we'll be sharing more about this on for Thursday. We're basically making commitments around that, which is like uh, transaction ordering is a free market and it's ordered based on priority fees and time of receipt. Uh, and that is kind of like the commitment that we're, we're upholding and we'll be doing work to make sure that that's transparent and visible. Um, and if that were to be violated, that would actually be a violation of the law of chain as well. That would be something that would potentially put us at risk of losing the ability to continue being able to be a sequencer. Um, and so we're very incentivized uh, and very committed to ensuring that we uphold these commitments we're making around neutrality. Because I think at the end of the day, the way we think about base is that it's, it's internet infrastructure. It's it's open extension of Ethereum, which has been this incredible gift, I think, that we've been given as a world because it is an open platform that puts everyone on a level playing field no matter where they are in the world. And I think our belief is that um, that characteristic, the open permissionless nature of Ethereum, must be extended to layer two if we want to have an open global on-chain economy. And so from a kind of like North Star perspective, obviously we have the North Stars around growth, but I think for our mission, which is kind of in increasing economic freedom all around the world, that North Star around ensuring this stuff actually remains open and accessible to everyone is equally, if not more important. Let me ask a question that, you know, I saw had some controversy online. It's possible that like you have the answer ready to go. When BASE was originally introduced, there was a specific percent commitment of the economics of running the sequencer that was going to go towards, you know, the optimism framework. Um, and later that specific economic commitment was removed as far as I understand it. What it is accidentally published. It was accidentally published on the website. It was crazy. I did so many reviews of that website and that was there from the beginning and it's like not a finalized number. It was a placeholder at the time um, and got accidentally published. And then we just so what what yeah. is the number? Is it TBD? Coinbase doesn't yet know how it wants to contribute. Like, what's your Very much sense? Decided, and we'll be shared more on Thursday. 
Yeah. Okay. Decided, but not yet revealed. Yeah. Not, not publicized, but will be publicized on, on, uh, later this week. Is it 10%? Uh, (laughs) be publicized later this week. Um, Is it more than 10%? (laughs) This show is coming out on Thursday, by the way, just FYI. Uh, It's coming out on Thursday. Um, it is, it's, it's going to be published today when you're hearing this, just be careful. You know, we have a whole, we have a whole, we have a whole, you know, right, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes once you guys do announce what those um, numbers you know, are. We're going to be sharing okay, more great. information about that on Thursday or when this when this podcast is released. Um, you know, we think that like being open and transparent about this is super important. And and I think the thing that one thing that gets me really excited about is a there's a specific number, but b that's going to be all on chain. So like the split that's happening is a smart contract. And it will be directly visible by the whole world of like, oh, these, these transaction fees are coming in. They're getting split. Here's how the split works. Here's what the mechanics are. Here's what flows to who. And I think that is like, no one's done that before, right? Like this is this is like totally novel. And you have a large public company like Coinbase really like leading the way in figuring out how this actually works. And I, I guess the last point I'll make on this is to that point of no one's done this before, like, we spent the last nine months giving our best effort to try and figure out how to do this in the best possible way that prioritizes this neutrality commitment that we have that leans into what we believe is going to enable an open global on-chain economy and increase economic freedom globally. Um, but there's no, there was no paved road. No one was like, hey, here's the playbook for how you take a large public company and you work with you know, a forward-looking on-chain DAO and you do a structure that lets you launch an open permissionless blockchain. And so we have had to make a ton of decisions over the last nine months. And we wrote the first version of the Law of Chains in collaboration with Optimism. We picked a bunch of numbers. We made decisions. And we think they're good decisions, but they're certainly not perfect. And so I think we are excited to hear feedback and, and input from other folks or across the ecosystem. Um, and we're excited to keep you know, trying to figure out how to do this in the best way possible. We don't have all the answers. Um, we just have what we think are the right intentions uh, to try and do this in a way that, that feels and looks right. So we're going to- Oh yeah, I, I just want to echo that it's, it's commendable that Coinbase as a public company is able to innovate to the degree where it's able to launch you know, what amounts to be like an incredible experiment and do so publicly in the public sphere in, and it's something that nobody really anticipated. So I, you know, I, I, I'm impressed by the fact that, you know, Coinbase is doing it and, you know, Coinbase is obviously subject to a lot of like criticism and, you know, analysis because it is basically, you know, the largest crypto business, you know, in the U S and so, you know, I, I think it just makes, you know, the fact that you launched um, a chain within that environment even more impressive. Appreciate that. Day one. We got a lot more work to do. I will definitely echo that, that, um, you know, obviously we all have uh, different criticisms of, you know, there's there's never going to be a lack of criticism because it's crypto. But yeah, here for it. <laughs> um, it. Very, very impressive. The, the integrity and the consistency that you guys have shown in trying to execute on this vision. And I know that it's a hard one. One of the things that I'd like to dig into a little bit more, which you alluded to, is the relationship between base and optimism generally. So, you know, you guys mentioned, okay, there's going to be a revenue split with the sequencer between, um, some revenue split between uh, Coinbase itself and then the the Optimism Collective. What I'd like to dig into a little bit more is, you know, uh, base, as far as I understand, it's basically kind of an off-the-shelf implementation of the OP stack. And the same is true for Optimism Mainnet, which is now the what they call, I think, the original Optimism uh, layer two before they started creating more little baby optimisms. OP mainnet, sorry, OP mainnet, OP mainnet. How do you think about the relationship between these two chains? Naively, I would assume that they are cannibalistic to each other in the sense that you want great applications to build on base. Uh, OP uh, holders want great applications to be built on OP mainnet. And there is a certain kind of zero sumness. Now I know it's also crypto. And so, you know, we all kind of labor under this, uh, this, this ideology that, well, no, it's not really zero sum. And like, it's all kumbaya and everyone's happy, but like, you know, OP has a token, Coinbase has a share price. There is a real tug of war that's happening somewhere. How do you think about that? And how should we think about that? Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing I'd say is the vision is, uh, what we call the super chain, which like, just to put it all, like, it's it's one unified chain that brings all these things together. And so I think where we're going 
in the next few years is that these pieces are going to fit more and more together. Um, they're going to uh, kind of be connected and they're going to be one thing. And so I think that that means that, yes, there are definitely components of like, you know, which chunk of the super chain is going to have more or less of the applications. But I think there's also the component of like, we're all building towards this shared vision where these things work really, really well together. And so that's the starting point. It's like, there's not just the competitive nature, there's also the collaborative nature and the vision of building towards something bigger than any one of us. Um, in terms of how these things are kind of different or, or separate, um, I've, been, I've been trying to, I think we're all trying to figure out the mental model for this. Uh, and the one that I've been kind of excited about recently or, or been thinking about more is, and a lot of this comes from the law of chains and the thinking that we've done on that is, is almost like a, a federalism model where you have kind of like the national body that is the super chain of all these things that come together. And then you have state bodies or, you know, sub region bodies um, that are the components of that and that are all, you know, similarly kind of competitive, right? Like you could say like California and New York are competitive, but they're also just different they're like parts of the whole and they have so jesse when you're when you're saying super chain yeah. is this literally a single chain or is this like a metaphor that you're using i'm trying to understand what you're saying here. this 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 is the vision of the op stack and and what we're building which is that basically over the next few years we're going to take all of these op stack chains we're going to make it so that they have a shared bridge they have shared upgrades they have shared homogenous commitments to block space they have shared commitments to neutrality and we're going to piece them together through interoperability and so we're going to basically build bottoms up a uh, combination of all of these layer twos. Uh, that's that's the vision because we don't think that it can happen on one chain. Uh, we think that it has to happen across many of these things because that's how we actually get the throughput. And I think if you go back to the original scaling vision of Ethereum, Ethereum's original vision was like, we're going to shard the L1. And then they were like, oh no, that doesn't really work because we want to have more of a free market. And what we're now saying is like, we're going to do the opposite of that. We're going to build bottoms up. And we're going to say, let's start with a bunch of L2s that are disparate, and then let's make a bunch of social and technical commitments that bring them together and actually make them one thing that can scale Ethereum. So, well, so this is very, this is very interesting. This is very interesting the way that you put this because in the original vision of Ethereum, right, you had all these different uh, shards, each of the, which were going to be you know fully execution ready and able to do everything that Ethereum one could do, um, and those shards were all going to talk to each other and, like you said, be interoperable and so on. But the difference between these shards and the vision you're laying out for the super chain kind of interconnected super highway thing is that each of those shards is the native token of each of those shards is ether. And the value flows, it, it's sort of all socialized under a single state. It's like sort of one gigantic super state. What you're describing is, like you said, more of a federalist system where you have individual sovereigns, right? You have, you know, Kentucky and you have California and you have New York and they each kind of fight with each other and they fight for resources. And it, it's, they're, they're united, but they're also, they are sovereign with respect to each other. And um, in, a, in a world where you have all these different chains that are working together in some kind of super state, let's say, um, no connection to what Robert was doing. Yeah, I was um, about to be like, where no, 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 sorry. I've been, it just, I've been it just, picking this it just up and being like, me. it just flowed out of me. I couldn't, I couldn't help yeah, it. Yeah. What, what um, type of what type? Did, are you are you telling me Ro you were trying to get Robert to buy a bunch of your shares, and that was just a little call out there, buddy? <laughs> I've I, given I, up. I, Tarun, I, at this point, I've been so emasculated by how you've destroyed me. At I, I'll just say I, I bought I, I bought Tarun shares and not Hasib shares. Oh, thank you. thank you, Rob. Great. I'm going to dump your share. I'm going to dump your, the single share that I own of you, Robert. I'm oh, sorry, Key, Key. I, I apologize. I'm, just, I'm, I'm just a boomer. I can't stop calling them shares. Anyway, sorry, to finish the question. And actually, let me maybe direct this at Tarun and Robert, because you guys are investors into optimism. So, I, you know, Jesse's laid out this one vision. I want to get your guys' perspective. What do you think happens? You guys are, I mean, you, you might own, like, we own a tiny amount of Coinbase stock. You guys might as well. I don't know. But you certainly probably own a lot more OP than you own Coinbase, I'm going to guess. Um, how do you think about the interplay between OP mainnet and base? So, you know, there's a couple things. First off, I want to state that we have a lot of respect for all of the L2 ecosystems. Um, I think like they're all actually taking quite different design decisions into which kinds of properties they're preferring. So, you know, I think like, in the Polygon case, it's kind of, you know, obviously the new token changes things a bit, but I think the idea of like having shared 
ZK resources across many rollups in a way that amortizes costs for people building is super important. Um, I think in the Arbitrum case, like the programming flexibility is a higher value in a lot of ways. And you look at things like Stylus and in OP, I think the, the key seems to be a lot more freedom in, in choices like what data availability layer you're going to use, like which proofs are you going to deal with to, to Jesse's point earlier about the multiple implementation. So, you know, in, in an ideal world, I, I actually really like all of these different models. I am actually not uh, like, Hey, one of them is actually strictly better than the others. There are actually certain applications where you do need ZK all the time. And like, yeah, you want to lower the proving costs amongst everyone. Right. So, in the in the say polygon version of this, I, I don't actually know the, the zk sync uh, or Starkware exactly how the amortization is working. I've only kind of read the polygon side. It makes a ton of sense to share that cost across different chains, and so I view these kind of collectives, at least from an economic layer, as like unions that are kind of sharing some resource costs amongst them, such that sort of their average cost to a user is a lot lower the worst case cost could still be bad right and like all that's where the different design decisions come in is like some of them make certain worst cases easier to run into or harder to run into but they're all trying to go towards some notion of like certain types of actions or transactions have lower average case costs within our ecosystem so i think the op one from the perspective of giving the most flexibility to developers is really interesting and, you know, like I said, I think all of them have kind of different trade-offs. I don't think there's like a, hey, here's the obvious reason this one is the best, if that makes sense. Like that, that I, I really think they're, they all have a lot of different merits for different types of applications. But I think OP's flexibility is one of the reasons you see so many developers really quickly jumping onto it. I think in Arbitrum's case, like they had a lot of consistency properties before OP in terms of like how block times were very consistent, Oracle's very consistent. So like it was way easier to do DeFi stuff there in a way that worked better. And there's, there's a, they end up being like all these kind of emergent phenomena trade-offs as well. So yeah, I, I, I think like it's still way too early to say like, hey, this is like clearly the winning, you know, all ecosystem that takes over if that, if that makes sense. And I'm not trying to hedge and be like, kumbaya. Yeah. Well, so you're describing the competition among L2 ecosystems. What about within the OP L2 ecosystem? Well, I'll, I'll lay this out from my perspective very simply. So had Coinbase used a different foundation to create their chain versus using optimism and there's a, you know, as of Tuesday, TBD sort of sharing relationship between you know the base sequencer and you know returning value back to optimism. But just between these two paths, it's clearly better for optimism for you know Coinbase to use optimism as opposed to rolling their own thing. Fact. But it's also far, far, far worse than Coinbase saying we've selected optimism as our canonical chain that we're going to use and integrate into the Coinbase suite. And th there is a path where, you know, I do think Coinbase could have. <laughs> you know, said, well, we're just going to, you know, select optimism and use it and integrate it and make this the thing that we use and to come up with some opportunity for, you know, Coinbase, you know, to be very involved in that process. This outcome is like, I would say like 75%, you know, down the chart in terms of, you know, benefit to optimism. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I agree. I mean, and this is this really depends on how you think about optimism. If you think about optimism as that single chain, sure, like yeah, that's the case. If we're thinking in that zero sum way, but if you think about optimism as the sum of all of these chains and the super chain, I actually think having Coinbase join and lead the way there, which is now being followed. Right? You have Zora, you have Public Goods Network, you have Avo. Like, you know, how many o OP stack chains are following the lead of Coinbase doing this? And my my intuition, you know, from all my conversations with Optimism, Optimism is not OP mainnet. Optimism is the super chain. Like that's that's what optimism is, and um, that's a shift, right? It's a shift from where we were a year ago, but that's a very intentional shift driven by the team, um, because I think all of us believe that there's something bigger than a single chain. That a single chain can't do it all. 
Um, and going back to your point, Hasib, I've been trying to think, like I, I kind of share this federalism mental model. And the way I think these things are ultimately going to play out is if you believe that, if you believe that OP mainnet is not optimism, but optimism is all of these things, then you have to think about what is OP mainnet. And my best mental model, I've been trying to figure out like, what is what are these things? Is OP mainnet's basically Washington, D.C.? And maybe base is California and maybe Zora <laughs> is like Brooklyn, New York, right? Like, uh -huh. you know, th th these are different cultural places. And I think the thing that is going to happen with OP mainnet is in a world where you have many chains that are all part of the super chain and you have optimism, which is kind of the, the body of all of these things, the place where OP lives is the like, it's kind of sacred. Like it's the place where the governance lives. It's the place where like you have the seat of the government that's kind of helping define and figure out how all these things interoperate together. And so, you know, D does DC have an economy? Absolutely. Like, does it have creativity? Absolutely. But like, is it all of the economy of the United States? Is it the biggest financial hub? Is it the biggest art hub? No, it's not those things because it's the government. And so I think that there's like a I think this is what we're going to see happen more as optimism and, and the super chain becomes more clear, like what this thing actually is. We're basically going to start to see segmentation um, where we see different cultures, different products, different applications find their natural home in the, the individual component of the super chain that makes the most sense for them. It's a very heartwarming vision that you're painting of, uh, you know, like, <laughs> Uh, base is California and they're, you know, DC, you're the Roman Senate or whatever over in, in OP mainnet. Um, it does feel to me a little bit like, I think what we might be alighting in this description is the difference between optimism, as you put it, and OP token. And OP token is also not the same thing as optimism. And, you know, I think from the perspective of an investor in optimism, which we are not, but Robert and Tarun are, um, there is a real, uh, there, there, there are real distinctions to be made between OP captures 100% of the revenue of this chain. It captures 10% of the revenue of this chain, 20% of the revenue of this chain. Um, and there's a certain real politique that emerges when you have to get increasingly granular with, hey, when we have a marginal shift of demand from the chain that we have 10% on to the chain that we have 5% on, um, that it, presumably, I mean, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know. It's obviously very early yeah, for these things. I think that's the question. Yeah, exactly. That, that is going to affect what people in DC think. Right. You know, when We're, you start seeing people moving from a place that pays high taxes to a place to pay low taxes. The real problem is is not even that. The real problem is the Alabamas of the world, right? Like the, the states that <laughs> contribute nothing. It's always the taxes. Alabamas. Always the it's Alabamas. Like always Alabama. And exactly. Right? Exactly. If you look at the net flow, like they cause the biggest problem. They get all the like subsidies. They get all or the Puerto Rico building stuff. Speaking of crypto. Yeah. Or people like I mean, literally saying, look, I'm no, no longer going to be paying federal taxes I, at all. I, I do, I do agree, but I think the idealism of the union is sometimes more necessary to force it into being in the beginning. And like, yeah, you deal with those problems later. Like that, you have to have that, my, that level of optimism ahead of time to even want to construct such a union, right? And I think this, this is, I mean, we'll be talking about this more on Thursday, but this is, this is like, this is a thing that I think optimism very uniquely has at this moment is you have a bunch of people who are making this commitment and saying, hey, we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And that, that's the commitment base is saying, right? We didn't go and say, we're going to do this by ourselves. Instead, we said, we mm. believe that at the end of the day, this is going to be bigger than us. And we want to help build that thing that's bigger than us. And I think that that's what Optimism is saying. I think that that's what Zora is saying. I think that that's what a bunch of these folks are saying. And my intuition is like, we've seen crypto be positive some for the last decade in really new ways. And I think that there's an opportunity for us to build something positive some here that's way bigger than base or OP mainnet or any single component of an L2 and is actually a super chain that brings a billion people on chain. And so is that a little crazy? Is it optimistic? Yeah. But like, here we are, we're going to do it. Hey. So you're saying optimism has a lot of optimism, if I'm hearing that right. Based on optimistic. I guess we, if only there was some way to know. Um, all right. So I, I think we're up on time. So we got to wrap. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesse, it was amazing having you on the show. Thanks for joining yeah, us and me, sharing guys. your views and taking our, taking our questions. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Awesome. So grateful to be here. Thanks, thanks everybody. Yeah.